Good morning, church, and welcome to our Sunday morning online service. Let's start our Sunday morning service with a quick word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we do want to thank you uh, again just for this opportunity that we have to, to praise you in song. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to sing from the heart. And Father, I do pray too that you be with us as we spend some time in your word this morning, Lord. I pray that you'd be with Pastor and that you'd speak through him, Lord. We thank you for him and we thank you for his leadership, Father. And I pray that you give us all listening ears, Father, and help us not just to be hearers of your word, but doers of your word, Lord. And I, again, I do pray that uh, your spirit would be at work uh, this morning, that you'd work in our hearts, that you'd convict us, Father, and um, we give you all the glory and the praise for what's going to take place. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with me and turn to hymn number 47, Fairest Lord Jesus. Again, that's hymn number 47. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Again, that's hymn number 446. There's ever a time to lean on his arms, it's now. Amen. Safe and secure from 
today. Thank you for those who are here this morning, this afternoon. I'm uh, grateful for the chance to be together uh, this way. I do have some announcements I'd like to share with you. We sent a video out, I believe it was Thursday afternoon, uh, describing a couple different things. One of those was our discipleship groups that will be starting this coming week. Uh, I mentioned that these are really small Bible study groups that we're trying to have here at the church. It gives us an opportunity to come together on a smaller scale. Uh, and so we will be keeping those groups at 10 people uh, per group. And we're planning to hold to get our first meetings this coming week. The ladies I uh, mentioned we sent out a, a, a chance for you to enroll in one of those via a link. Uh, ladies, you have the options of 2 o'clock on Tuesday, 6.30 on Thursday, and then 10 o'clock in the morning on Friday, and then our men Monday at 4.30 and Thursday at 6.30. And this is open to all those who are 16 and older. I encourage you, if you didn't see that link, we'll be sending it out again here uh, shortly, but please just click that link, uh, follow the directions on that form, and that'll get you enrolled in one of those classes. And again, just plan to meet uh, here at the church in the King's Kids room uh, during that time in which uh, we will you'll be enrolled. Uh, you will, we'll be planning to meet uh, every every week uh, on a weekly basis until we're able to come back together again as a church. Once that's taken place, we'll plan to go to every other week that these groups will be meeting. And really, I am excited. If I can encourage you to enroll in one of these, I'm excited about what the Lord is going to use, how the Lord is going to use those in our in the life of our church. Really encourage everyone to get involved in one of these. If you have any questions about that or how to get enrolled, if you can't follow the link or whatever the case might be, please contact me. I'll help you with that. Then also sent out in that video a little bit of explanation as far as our online giving we've made available. Uh, you can give through our church website, midlandsbbc.org, and just find the giving link, or you can go through the Tithely, it's tithe.ly app. And again, encourage if you choose to use this convenience to give through that app, we're asking if you would be sure to cover the fees that are associated with that. I think it's a 2.9% fee for credit cards and debit cards, and then a 1% fee for a ACH transaction. So if you got any questions about that, uh, you certainly can see me about it. I'd be happy to help you with it. Don't forget, you have to have your prayer request for our Wednesday night service submitted to me by 4 o'clock on Tuesday. Uh, Mark Bailey will be here uh, this coming week, and he's going to be leaving on the 24th, so that's our deadline. If you've got anything you'd like to give to the Helping Hands ministry, he is specifically looking for someone who might have a hospital bed or a motorized wheelchair. There's a great need in, in the ministry an individual has for those things. If you happen to have one, you're not... Uh, using anymore, know somebody who does, uh, it'd be great to, to get that. But in other things besides clothing that would be helpful to church planners or missionaries, he will be here to collect those this coming week. And then the church cleaning schedule, we are asking those who are on the cleaning schedule to continue cleaning. The church is still being used, and so we're asking if those uh, are able to please continue to do so. The Lydic Carper and the Hatfield Taylor teams have church cleaning this week. Please grab your hymnals and uh, stand with me and turn to hymn number 462, Higher Ground. Again, that's hymn number 462. Thank you. 
Still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. I faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Amen. You can be seated at this time. Patty Clement's going to come and bless us with the special. Didn't you? There's a number, number of extra verses there we don't normally get to sing. I'm grateful for that. I appreciate that very much. A couple prayer requests I'd like to share with you. I meant to do so during our announcements time, but a couple that I just want to mention uh, this morning. Continue, if you would, praying for John Lunt. He is, as many would know, I sent out a message, I think, Wednesday or Thursday. Um, but he did contract COVID-19, and he is um, struggling with some severe headaches and shortness of breath. Uh, has seen some improvement over the last days. We thank the Lord for that. Uh, but he's still uh, hospitalized at Bergen Mercy and just struggling with some of the side effects of this uh, illness. So please continue to pray for Brother John. And then Abby Huntley is going in tonight to be induced. And so we pray for her and uh, Brother Mick, of course. Pray for a smooth delivery, a fast delivery, and all that goes into uh, when having a baby. Um, and of course, I have all the extra wrinkles that this virus presents. So if you would just pray for uh, Miss Abby and Brother Mick and that new baby girl coming along. So look forward to getting to meet her when we can. Have you turned to Ephesians chapter 4 this morning? Ephesians 4. And this is going to be part one of the message. Uh, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4, I was hoping to preach uh, verses, well, verse 7, really, to verse um, 16. And as I was studying, I said, you all don't want to be here 
all day on <laughs> Saturday, and those watching, you don't want to be watching this all Sunday. It was going to be, it would have been way too long. So I tried to divide it in a, in a logical spot. But really, the idea, the thought there in verse 7 picks up, goes through verse 16. In fact, verse 11 through verse 16 is one long sentence. So it's really not a good place to uh, divide this. So we're going to stop in verse 12 this morning, and Lord willing, Wednesday night, pick it up in verse 13. Uh, so go ahead and stand with me, verse 7, and we'll read down through verse 12. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love." Gifted for growth. That's the message title today. Gifted for growth. Let's pray. Father, I do ask for your blessing, your help now. Uh, Lord, you know, Father, that I am uh, in this great need, Lord, of your grace. Lord, of your amazing grace, as we just heard sung about. Lord, to uh, help communicate this message clearly. Father, there's a lot here, a lot that we need to catch, we need to understand, we need to apply to our lives. And so I pray for your help. And, communicating. I pray for each one that is uh, here today, that is watching this video. Uh, Lord, that you'd help them to have uh, listening ears. Uh, Lord, they would have a heart to hear and not just to hear, but Father, to apply the message this morning. Lord, I pray you have your will done in each one of us. Lord, our hearts would be surrendered to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Appreciate you standing there. <clears throat> Well, I don't think it's a stretch to say that everyone likes a good gift, likes to be given a, a good gift, whether it's a Christmas gift, birthday gift, wedding, graduation gift, whatever the occasion, maybe it's just one of those just because gifts that you might get from somebody. We always, I think, like to en uh, enjoy receiving a good gift. We probably all of us, if we took the time, could think of some really good gifts you've received. Maybe it was a gift that was over and above what you were expecting or just something that you know, just blew your socks off and I can't believe you you gave me a gift like that or maybe it was one of those very thoughtful gifts that just hit the spot you know somebody who gave that's reflecting that they know you very well and they knew exactly what to give you uh, of course we know that not every gift we get is a good gift not every gift gift that's given is a good gift there are such a thing as bad gifts out there though we maybe wouldn't call them that we'd say that's just not in the category of a good gift but if somebody gives you something that you don't want or you don't need or you can't use or maybe something that was intended to be a blessing but it really becomes more work than what you thought it might be. I, I think of a gift I gave my wife. I think I've shared this with you before. But I, I, uh, she was back, this is back way, way back before we had kids uh, six years ago. And uh, she left for, I think it was a ladies retreat one night kind of thing. So I was alone for 12 hours or something like that. And she was away and I... I uh, got lonely. And I said, man, is this like what it's like for her all the time? Uh, and so I went out to the pet store and I bought her one of those beta fish. And my intention was I'm going to have someone there. We called him Panion. He was giving me her companion while I'm at work. And so um, anyway, it turns out this gift wasn't a, a blessing. It was a curse. It was a, a lot of extra work for her that she ended up doing most of it. A uh, stinky gift that things stunk <laughs> pretty bad. Um, and so what I intended to be a blessing was really not a great gift for her at all. I was, I'm pathetic. And 12 hours without somebody around, I had no to do. She, on the other hand, was, I think, just fine. And you ask her today, she'd be happy for 12 hours. So, you know, um, <laughs> certainly the case. Not every gift is a, a good gift. Of course, we know the Bible says 
every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. That's right. It comes from our Lord. So if there's a good gift that's given, a perfect gift that's given, if we have something that you say in our lives is a blessing, we know that it is directly or indirectly from our benevolent Heavenly Father. Every blessing we have. If you got your health, thank the Lord for it. You say, yeah, I don't have my health. If you got your life, then thank the Lord for your life. Thank the Lord for your job, for your, your home, for your everything we have. We ought to be, again, very thankful to the gifts that he gives us. Like we all like, everyone likes to receive a good gift. These Ephesian believers here at the church at Ephesus uh, had received a very good gift. You know anything about the Ephesians or the book of Ephesians, you know that it's written to the church at Ephesus. And if you know anything about the church at Ephesus, you know it was in the city of Ephesus. We're going too deep for anybody yet? It was in the city of Ephesus. If you read there in Acts chapter 19, you'll find where the, the, uh, Paul's, one of his first uh, adventures or missionary adventures into this city, the city of Ephesus. And you know that this city was known for the, the temple of Diana, one of the, the uh, you'd say, ancient wonders of the world. And they were there, and Paul gets himself in a little bit of trouble with the silversmith who, who is living, came on selling these trinkets, these idols that worshipers would buy when they would come to worship at the temple of Diana. Like most cities in the Roman Empire, Ephesus was corrupt. It was debauched. It was wicked. It was, it was a, a cruel place. And this church in the book of Ephesians is tasked with reaching these people. They have a great, um, uh, you'd say, great responsibility, a great task ahead of them, something that would beyond, be beyond what they could do in and of themselves. You think of, uh, again, ministering in a wicked culture, in a wicked society. We know as Americans that we are called to minister in a wicked place, a wicked society, even though we'd say, all of us would say, we're thankful for the godly heritage in our country. And we are thankful for what we say, godly influences we have today in America. There are many, there are many churches. We think about where this world is. We are blessed beyond measure, and yet we know our nation is not, by any stretch of an imagination, a godly place. It's an ungodly society and an ungodly culture. We are called, like Ephesians, like the Ephesians were, to, to minister there. And so the things that Paul writes to the, to the Ephesian believers are things that we ought to pay attention to. I've so thoroughly enjoyed reading this book this past week. I've read it a, a couple times just trying to get familiar with where we are here. I encourage you this week. We're going to be in it again Wednesday night, Lord willing. So just read it a few times here between now and then. It's just a, it's a fantastic, so much that is given to us in this book. And so the first three chapters, just so you're aware, are, are more doctrinal in nature. Paul is giving us some very deep, very important, very um, very helpful truth. But you'd say more doctrinal in nature. Chapter 4 through chapter 6, you'd say, are more application in their nature. And so Paul's applying some of the things he lays down in the first couple chapters of the book. And now he's helping us here in chapter 4 apply it. And one of the first things that God inspires Paul to apply or to, to bring to the attention of these Ephesian believers is this thing called unity within a church. I don't know about you, but I feel like I've heard something about unity recently. Hopefully you've watched our Wednesday night service. You know, Brother Mick preached on unity. Did a great job with it. I encourage you to go back. If you haven't uh, had a chance to watch that yet, go back and, and, and watch that video. But you see there in verse number three, if you wouldn't join me there, it says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit... In the bond of peace, he says, keep that unity. Don't let it go. Guard that unity. Work for that unity. You say, how could these believers who were ministering in this corrupt culture, how could they have unity? Well, look at verse number four. They had one, they had lots of things in common. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So they had a lot of things in common through Christ. In Christ, right. they did. Verse 7, where our text is this morning, picks, us, picks up there where we left off. Just a very quick recap or, or, or a synopsis of what these first six, first, first six verses are talking about. And you get there, verses 4 through 6, you've got one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing. There's a lot of unity. Again, that's the thrust. Verse 7 speaks to diversity. Within this unity that you have, there is diversity. Now, we know that's the case in the life of a church. You have diverse people. You have people from different backgrounds and cultures and, and, and uh, temperaments and all different types of people within a church. And that's not necessarily what he's talking about here, though the church at Ephesus did have that. He's talking about diversity in gifts. Diversity in gifts. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us there are diversities in gifts. 
within the unity of this church. He's talking about a variety, an array of different gifts that have been given. These first uh, couple of verses, verses uh, 7 through 10, help us understand every believer, every believer has been graciously gifted by Jesus Christ. Every believer has been graciously gifted by Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. I already said we like a good gift, don't we? This is, think about, talk about a good gift. This is a great gift. He says we are all given grace. We just heard it sung about amazing grace. The grace that we would call saving grace. We've all been given that. If you're a believer, you know you've received saving grace. You've received something you didn't earn. We could go back to chapter 2 and talk about or read how it says, for by grace are ye saved. We know that if you're here, listen, you're here today, you're watching today, you've been saved. You know it's not anything you did, is it? It's nothing you earned. It's nothing that you worked for. It's nothing that you, you uh, conjured up in your life or you did so many good things in a row and you, you earned your salvation. That's not the case. And listen, if you're watching here today and you understand, you say, I, I don't know what it means to be saved or I'd like to be saved. Please understand, you will not work for your salvation. Right. You cannot work for your salvation. Salvation is a gift of grace, something you can't earn. Grace given through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we know about, we're very well acquainted with saving grace. And we thank the Lord for saving grace. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about what we call maybe serving grace. Grace to serve. Serving grace. It's not the great, obviously, saving grace isn't the only type of grace. It's not the only thing that God gives us that's unmerited. The grace that he gives us, which equips us to serve him. We, we talks, he talks about, he said gifts there in the end of verse number seven and the end of verse number eight, talking about these gifts. And listen, every one of us, every one of us has been given a gift by God's grace. And that gift is meant for service. So a question here we have to consider. What are these, these gifts? He again talks about it there in the end of verse 7, the end of verse 8. Gifts that have been given. What are they that have been graciously given by Christ? Well, the Bible uses the word gift to speak of a number of different things. We mentioned James 1.17, the gifts that God gives us. We could think about how the Holy Spirit was called the gift. And that's not what he's talking about here. Okay, He's not talking about the Holy Spirit because he says unto the, the, the measure. He basically is going to see, we're going to see in just a second, that, that what's given is not given in equal amounts. Not everybody gets the same amount. Some are given more than some others. And so we know the Holy Spirit's not given that way. I'm thankful nobody can say, I've got more of the Holy Spirit than somebody else does. God gave me, he was extra, extra special. I got more than you did. And that's not the case with the Holy Spirit. We all have as much as we're ever going to have. Yes, but what he is talking about, what I believe he's talking about, and you would know a different type of, of gift would be the spiritual gifts that are talked about in 1 Corinthians 12. Romans chapter 12, other places that talk about the spiritual gifts based on the context of this passage and on the, the fact that we're talking about service within the local church and we're talking about ministry within a local church, I think it makes very uh, good sense that he's talking about these spiritual gifts. There are at least 20 different gifts that are listed in these different lists that you have in the New Testament talking about the spiritual gifts that one can have, at least 20 different things that are enumerated as gifts. <clears throat> Some that are not in use today. Things like tongues and interpretation, miracles and prophecy, for instance. Those gifts have been done away with. They're no longer necessary. They're no longer useful. They're no longer needed. Right. The way that these gifts are listed, again, if you look here, you look in uh, Romans 12, you look in 1 Corinthians 12, a couple spots there in 1 Corinthians 12, the way that the gifts are listed, they're, there's nowhere given an exhaustive list. It's almost as if this is a sampling the Holy Spirit gives gifts, and there is a wide array of things that God can give us that you'd say are a spiritual gift for us to use in service, but it's not like these are just the ones that you have to pick among the 20 or however many that are that are applicable. No, the idea is, as you study the, the spiritual gifts out, which is not what we're doing today, so we don't have the time to jump into all that, but the idea is really that there's a whole diff bunch of different things that God can give you that would be termed a spiritual gift. Some of the gifts that no doubt you've heard of, encouragement, help, the gift of wisdom, knowledge, faith, governments, exhortation, the gift of giving, of mercy. That's just a sampling of some of those that are listed for us in the Word of God. Some that are very generic. You say, well, mercy or, or giving or faith. You mean that I don't have to, if that's not my spiritual gift, do I not have to give? Or do I not, do I not have to be merciful? Or do I not have to have faith? No, obviously not. 
But what is communicated is that some are given a special, you'd say, um, ability with those things, or they're given a special emphasis with those things, and they are a, given a, a special way or a special, uh, you'd say, ability, really, to minister in those things. That is really what a spiritual gift is. Amen. They're not just natural ability. They're talents that God gives us. They are things that he gives us for the express purpose of serving within his church. Amen. Okay? So notice what the verse says. Again, it says the first part, unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Listen, you have, if you're saved, you've been given a gift of service. God's given you something he he's intends for you to use in serving within the church. You say, well, that's not me. I'm not, I don't have a gift. I've not been given anything. No, listen, if you're every one of us, and that's the, the indication he was speaking to the Ephesian church. And every one of them have been given a gift. Listen, every one of those who in Midland Bible Baptist Church are saved have been given a gift. Amen. You have a gift. God intends for you to use for his purposes. Right. He has gifted us, the Bible says, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. I've got to mention, understand this, that when we're talking about spiritual gifts, God is not like your grandma at Christmas. Who, for all of her grandchildren, would maybe, I don't know if your grandma did this, or, or maybe your mother or somebody else when you were given a gift for Christmas, but you would know that she spent the same amount of money on every single one of the grandkids. You don't want to, you know, have any type of, of favoritism or anything like that within the grandkids. They didn't want, you know, one to say, I got a bigger present than you did. So grandmas can very, very, uh, be very careful when they're giving gifts. Make sure they, they, they level it up so everybody gets the same. There's no contention from the gifts that are given. God's not like that. All right. The idea here is that some are given more than others. That's why you read about the talents that are given. Some are given five. Some are given two. Some are given one. The idea is not how much you get so much as is what are you doing with what God has given you. That's good. You say, well, that's not fair that God would give somebody more than somebody else. That's not, that's not just. That's not fair. Listen, he's God. Yeah, right. He knows what his church needs, right. and he distributes gifts accordingly. And so he knows exactly. Don't please don't don't again. We would we ought not to respond with anger that that God would do that. Because God gives these gifts in this way, and He He divides them according to His will. There should be no jealousy. Yeah. There should be no envy when it comes to service within a church. It shouldn't be well. Why does this person do this and I don't? Or why does that person seem to and and I don't have that? That ought not to ever be our attitude. That's right. You say well I. I've been given a gift. Maybe I don't, in my perception, I don't feel like I've been given as much as somebody else. Should that breed in our life's complacency or apathy, thinking that, well, I've not been given as much as that person has. Therefore, I'm just going to, I can't do as much. So I'm going to kind of just be on the fringes here and I'll, I'll you know, dabble in Christian service. No, absolutely not. God has given you something to do. He's given you an ability to use it. Use it to the best of your ability. Again, take that one talent or that two talents or however many, you say, talents or gifts that you've been given and invest them to the fullest. Use them to God's glory. Amen. So he gives these gifts, verse 7. Verses 8 through 10, we're not going to spend a lot of time here. Basically, you'd say it's a parenthesis to the main thought of this passage here. He's going to give some explanation as to the character of the one who gives the gifts. All right, so look at verse number uh, eight. We're going to find that the giver of these gifts is our ascended, victorious Savior. All right, that's the one who gives these gifts. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. This verse basically, it's a, an Old Testament partial quotation of Psalm 68, 18. So if you were to go back to Psalm 68, 18, you'd find some of that. There And if you read the whole psalm, you'll find that this verse is a good synopsis of it. What that psalm is communicating is this, that God is victorious. He is victorious over his enemies, and he can give gifts to whom he will. He can do that. He has the ability. He has the authority to do that. You see the verse there uh, where it says he led captivity captive. The language, that, again, that picture in Psalm 68 was God giving physical victory over Egypt over the, the enemies that Israel had in the land of Canaan. He had victory over them. He would take what they had and give it to his people. He blessed his people based on the victory that he had won. Like leading captivity captive. That, again, the picture there is you, you in your mind think of a Roman general who's been out away for years battling the, the tribes in Germany or, or you know, someplace in Africa or something, and he comes back, 
And with him, he has the spoils of a great campaign. He has all the, all the spoils to show for it. He has the gold and the riches, and he'd have captives. He would have, have enemies, enemy uh, um, combatants that had been subjected. And maybe they're, they're tied up, and they're, they're in this parade, and they would march through the cities of Rome, the, the streets of Rome, and the general would show off, basically, my victory, see what I've done. I've, I've led these ones captive. And that's the picture that's being portrayed. You say, why does, Paul, uh, why does God have Paul talking about this? Well, think about our Savior, who came to this earth. He died on the cross, was buried. For three days. But what happens on Sunday? We celebrate the victory of our Savior over death, over sin, over hell, over Satan. Listen, he is pictured, we know this to be the case, that he is our victorious Savior. The one who did, in fact, overcome and conquer all those different things. He is the victor, and we know that to the victor goes the spoils. And the idea here is he is the victorious savior. He can give what he wants to who he will. He won it. He's the conquering king. He can give what he wants to whom he will. That's the, the idea here. You say, well, what's it talking about with this whole he ascended and descended in verses 9 and 10? Well, that's basically, again, you see it in parentheses there. It's, it's not furthering the thought a whole lot. It's really giving explanation to verse 8. Well, basically it says this. We're going to, again, I, I can't get bogged down here. There's a lot to not get bogged down into. Um, <laughs> verse number eight, you see it. He says that he ascended up on high. Well, if Christ ascended, we know he did in Luke 24, Acts chapter one, you know, he, he was here on earth and he goes back to heaven. He ascends. Before he could ascend, he had to what? Descend. He had to descend, right? So he, the idea of verse nine is he came down to the lower parts of the earth. And some would look at that and say, well, is that talking about that time between his death and his resurrection? He went to hell and he burned in hell for three days. That's not what it's talking about. The Bible doesn't teach that. Uh, you say some people would look at that in the lower parts of the earth. He was he descended into Abraham's bosom. Or or some would look at that and say, that's what it's talking about. Some would say he was descended into the, the grave or, or a tomb. And some would just simply say it's him, his incarnation, which is kind of where I fall. You want to say it out yourself, go ahead. But I believe it's just talking, hey, he came down. He did what he intended to do. He was victorious over the grave. And then verse 10, he ascended back to heaven. He ascended, in fact, look what it says. He uh, descended also, ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. He, again, the idea is he's, a, he's above all. He's over it all. He's victorious. He has all authority. He won the victory. He now has the ability to give what he wants to whom he will. So, our victorious, our ascended Christ, our Savior, has gifted you. He's given you a gift. He's given all a gift. To some, he's given these gifts that we're talking about. He's given to spiritual leaders. And they are even termed a gift. Look at verse 11, all right? Still with me? All right, we're going somewhere with all this, so stick with me. Gotta, gotta, gotta stay tuned. Y'all on, on board? Pause it, catch your breath, and anyway, stick with me, okay? Verse 11. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Some of the gifts that have been given were to be apostles, those who uh, we know saw Christ resurrected. The 12, and then, well, of course, Paul was made an apostle. These men saw the resurrected Lord, and they were appointed to a position, a place of leadership. That's not the only way that apostles used in the New, De in the New Testament, but that's the idea here, I believe, that he's talking about those 12 apostles, the 13 apostles that had the, the uh, you'd say, the official um, position of an apostle, okay? By the way, there are none left. Right. Right. So there may be people that say they are apostles. <laughs> And you people can say that they're apostles. There are no, you'd say, apostles in this sense of the word. That's right. You see apostles, you see prophets. A prophet, though we don't have complete clarity as far as what that might be, but it's, I believe it's one who is given revelation before the Bible was complete. Yeah. Okay? But a prophet, in this sense of the word, again, don't, don't take that and apply it to every time you see the word prophet. You see Old Testament prophets. Different thing, different animal, okay? This is a New Testament prophet. This would be somebody who, listen, the church at Ephesus did not have what we have, a complete canon of Scripture. Right. 
And so what God would do, he had a spiritual gift that he gave to some people who basically would go and they would say, this is what God has said. And they wouldn't necessarily have a Bible and be reading from it. They would be given, you'd say, special revelation for that time. Those churches there, again, a different thing than what we have today. Is it, is it accurate to say that a preacher, someone who stands up, is a prophet? Yes, it is. So long as they are proclaiming what's already been said. That's right. If they're the prophet that says, well, I've received from heaven in my dreams last night or my visions of my, uh, of my bed. I, I've, I've received from the Father some new revelation. That's not today. Yeah. Okay. In fact, if you were to go back to chapter 2, we don't have time to go there, but chapter 2, verse 20, talks about how the apostles and the prophets were the foundation of that church. They were first generation, and as in like once the canon was complete, once the church was, was established, there was no need for these anymore. That's right. And they were gone. Okay. Yeah, a lot more there. And I apologize if I breeze past that too quickly, um, but more than what we have time to look at. And so he gives some the ability to be apostles. He gives some the ability to be prophets. And then he says, and some evangelists. We, we know what an evangelist, at least in our mind, an evangelist is someone who travels and preaches, right? And it's a little bit more than that. It, it does include that, but it's basically someone who bears or declares the good news, which in that strict sense, we are all to be evangelists, right? But he's talking about a special gift that's been given to people who would travel. We would think of maybe more in our vernacular today, a missionary or a church planter. Someone who goes and their express purpose is to plant a church, to preach the gospel, to see people reach. They're not maybe going to stay there long to pastor. They're looking to plant a church and move on and plant another church. That's an evangelist. Then you look at it, what it says there, pastors and teachers. Pastors and teachers, a pastor being a shepherd, one who cares for the flock. He feeds, he watches over, he leads, he encourages, he comforts, he corrects, he instructs the flock. Not everyone is called to be a pastor. He says, in the, he says pastor then and teacher, someone who communicates the truth of God's word. I'm thankful. There are many who, who, though they may not be pastors, are teachers. I think of our church. We've got a number of people who are, are gifted to be teachers. And they may never be behind this pulpit, but they are maybe in a children's classroom. Or they are in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody, and they are teaching. They are communicating God's word. I'm thankful, again, for, for that gift that God's given. So he gave some, gifted some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and they serve in those roles. And so by gifting them and then giving them to his churches, he's gifting his churches. And he gave them, listen, he gave them for this reason. If I can kind of encapsulate it all in one word. Service. Okay? Service. That's the reason behind these gifts. A question. Think about this. We're going to read verse 12 here in a second. Well, in fact, let's read it now. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Is that verse 12 just referring to the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in verse 11? It is referring to them, but keep the whole passage in mind. Right. All right. He says in verse 7, we're all gifted. We've all been given a gift. Verses 8 through verse 10, I understand, are, are more of like, a, you'd say, a parenthesis. They're explaining where these gifts come from and how God or Christ has the authority to give them. So if you were to, to uh, skip verses 8 through 10, again, not saying that they're not important, but if you were to read verse 7 into verse 11 and now into verse 12, you would maybe see a little bit clearer. The context does help us see. It's not just referring to what verse 12 talks about. It's not just for the pastors and teachers. It's for every gifted believer. And if you're a believer, you've been gifted. All of us have the responsibility that verse 12 places upon us. Look again at what it says. For the perfecting of the saints. He's gifted. Again, some of his pastors and teachers and evangelists for this work. But he's gifted all of us with spiritual gifts through his grace for the perfecting of the saints. The perfecting of the saints. Who are the saints? It's not the NFL team down in New Orleans. <laughs> NFL. It's not the what the Catholics would believe a saint to be. Yeah. Some historical figure in, in their church history who did something great or didn't do something great and they gave him sainthood. And they say saint so-and-so. That's not what a saint is. A saint is a believer. So if you're saved, look at Miss, or Miss 
Saint Patty. <laughs> Saint Patty, I don't have a day like that. I see, I see Saint Tina back there, Saint Nick, and Saint Michael, and, and others. And we're looking at the video. I know there's, there are lots of saints, believers, who are watching this. Okay, so don't think of a saint as some you know, historical figure in church history. If they were saved, sure. But you and I are, are saints. Yeah. Okay? For the perfecting of the saints. To perfect means to equip. To make ready. To adjust. It's to cause something to be ready for its assigned purpose. It's used, the word is used to set a bone. It's adjusted and for what purpose? To, to bring extreme pain to that person? It does do that, but it's not for that reason. It's to make that limb useful again, right? Or it, Brother Mick mentioned it on Wednesday night. In fact, it, Brother Mick was using, I believe, the verb form of this same word, where the fishermen would take their nets and they would mend their nets, again, for the purpose of using their nets for service, for work. And so the idea is there's an adjustment, there's an equipping there's a preparation that goes into the saints' lives in order to get them to where they are ready for service. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so what's happening, what he says, again, we make the application of verse 11. A pastor, a teacher has been given to adjust, to perfect, to equip, to, um, to help prepare for service. And so as, as your pastor, I, one of the things I try to hopefully do is, is to help you to be equipped for ministry. Equipped to serve the Lord. That's, that's one of the things I'm hoping to do. Is it just my responsibility? All of us who are gifted are to be involved in perfecting the saints. Amen. Part of the mission of this church ought to be, ought to be that we would equip, that we would adjust people so that they are ready, they are fit for service. We understand this. We need to be adjusted. There are things in our lives that happen where we got to say, that needs to be adjusted. Right. And God does do that, doesn't he? Where we spend time in the word of God and we spend time in devotions and prayer. We just, we're faithful to do that. Know what happens? God speaks to our hearts, doesn't he? And he says, you know, if there's some things in that part of your life that need to be changed, that need to be adjusted. If you're going to serve me the way I want you to, you need to adjust those things. But it's God through, you'd say, that personal time in the word, the only way that he adjusts us. No. Again, I, I hope as we come up here and we preach and we teach the word of God, that the word of God does that. Can it happen through a teacher? Absolutely. I hope it does. Can it happen through a fellow believer? Somebody that talks to you at church, Amen. reaches out to you. I hope it does. Amen. In fact, what I want to do that is take it even a step further. This ought to be something we are looking to do. We're, we're called, we're gifted, we're given grace to be, again, to be involved in the ministry. We ought to be looking for ways that we can help equip and help adjust. Or does that mean we ought to go around finger wagging saying, hey, I saw this in your life and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna wrap your knuckles for it. That's not what we're talking about. Yeah. What we are talking about is listen, a concern, a investment in other people, mm. namely in the church. Mm. That you and I, every one of us in Midland Bible Baptist Church, are looking for ways to help to adjust to uh, equip one another for ministry. The first reason for this giftedness, he says, is the perfecting of the saints. Look at the second one. We got to move on a little faster. That was a longer one. For the for the uh, the work of the ministry. That's the second reason he gives for the work. That word that none of us like, right? Or that we can avoid the the work of the ministry. The ministry. Listen, that word comes from the word we get deacon from. If you know the word deacon, it means a servant. Right. Our deacons who are watching, I, I hope anyway, <laughs> are watching the service this morning, they know that the word deacon comes from the one, from a word who, or basically someone who is a, a table waiter, a servant of tables, someone who serves other people. That is a deacon. That is what a deacon does. Although we maybe don't have that ministry of serving tables, a deacon is involved in serving within the church. That's where this word ministry comes from. It's service. It's a ministry. It's, it would really it would maybe be all-encompassing of every type of service that goes on within a church. I think of a nursery worker. I think of a, someone who's cleaning the, the, the church. I think of someone who's working on the vans or the buses. We think of somebody who's mowing the lawn. You think of somebody who's teaching a class. You think that's all ministry, mm -hmm. service, mm -hmm. 
work within a church. And we are, again, we're given these gifts for the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry. This, uh, you know, ministry is work. If you didn't know that, then you're not involved in ministry. <laughs> You've missed it somehow. I don't know what ministry you're involved in, but you know, I'm on the ministry where I come to church and sit there and, and leave and don't do anything. Well, I want that ministry. You know, that, that's not a ministry. Ministry is work. It's hard work. Listen, it's long. It's tiring work. It's burdensome work. It's vulnerable work. It can be heartbreaking work. Sometimes it's backbreaking work. Often it's thankless work. But listen, the work of the ministry is a necessary work. It's a rewarded work. It is. It's a worthy work. Listen, it's an eternal work work the work of the ministry is and the idea here again is every believer has been gifted we are all to be involved in the work of the ministry it's not like pastor andrew and brother mick they're full-time ministers or they're in full-time ministry it's their responsibility are there things that fall to those who are you'd say full-time ministers sure there are but if you understand the role of a pastor you know that as a pastor our jobs really are to be more facilitators helping equipping others to serve and to work Amen. and to do the work of the ministry Amen. say well, that mean you don't do anything no it's just there's plenty of work that goes involved that is involved in, in, in equipping and helping others serve in the ministry there, there's plenty that goes into that I appreciated one of the one of the individuals I read after in this passage. A commentator talked about how he went to a church, and in the bulletin of this church, they had um, the name of, of the pastor, and it said the assistant minister, and it gave the pastor's name. And then it said below that minister, the congregation. Right. Said, Pretty well put. <laughs> that the pastor. The, 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 those you'd say we call full-time ministers are really facilitating what all of us are to be doing. The work of the ministry that is given to all of us and to every one of us, it says. Look at the last one. You say the third purpose of these, these gifts that have been given is for the edifying of the body of Christ. The edifying of the body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? Well, it's the church. Yep. And what is the church? Yeah, That's us. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are that are dangling rabbit trails here. I'm going to try not to go down too far. <laughs> but Midlands Bible Baptist Church is the body of Christ. Yep. Okay, there is not one universal body. Yep. Right. There are not. There is no universal church. I, I I catch myself when I say local church because there's no other type. Right. But it's necessary because of all the winds of doctrine. Verse. 14, I think, talks about. There's a lot of winds of doctrine, and one of the big ones is a universal body, a universal church. And so I, I feel like I almost sometimes have to say local church to make sure we're all clear, but there's really no other. It's redundant to say. That's right. Um, and so he's speaking, and the, the book of Ephesians is speaking to a specific church. And so the things that are given to this the, in the book of Ephesians are written to the church at Ephesus. And there are many indications as you read the book that he is talking to these believers. He, he, Chapter 3 somewhere, I forget where it is, but he says, I'm talking to you, and I hope everybody knows this, but I'm talking to you. Again, more, many indications saying we're talking about a local church here. So the body of Christ, the church, we're gifted for the edification of that body. What's it mean to edify? It means to build up, to strengthen. It's used of how somebody might go and build a house or make or build a building. In this context, it has the idea of acting the act of one who promotes another's growth or development to help somebody else grow. That's what it means to edify someone. And we are find ourselves here saying we are equipped, we are gifted for the edifying of this church. So let me ask you this. What are you doing? Think about your life. What are you doing to build this church? 
And by that, I don't mean coming in and building walls and ceilings and floors. No, building the lives of the people that make up Business Bible Baptist Church. We have a responsibility to build their lives. We are to use our gifts to serve, to love, to equip, to build up others. Now, each one of these, this is just a point you can make a note of and in passing. You see three different distinct things that these gifts are given to us, and they're for these three reasons in verse 12. But you could also look at that and see it as a process, really, that grows upon itself. You perfect the saints. You equip the saints. They are equipped for the work of the ministry. What happens when you work the ministry? The body is edified, right? So you see that there are three separate things. Sure, they're separated by commas for a reason. But you also see that they're in a synchronized order. They're in tandem together. And so you do, you do the one, you do them all, they, they all contribute to the edifying, the edification of the church. <clears throat> so, these gifts we covered are from our victorious Savior. He has the, the ability, he has the authority to give these gifts because of the victory that he won. He gives them to every one of us. If you're a believer, you've been given a gift, and these gifts are for service. Verse 12. Christ has, listen, Christ has graciously gifted each member of Midlands Bible Baptist Church in order to serve in the building of this church. To serve in the building. Again, I don't mean in the building, but in the building, the edification this church in other words you and I we have been gifted for growth we've been gifted every one of us has been gifted for growth every member please please catch this every member has a part to play in seeing someone else grow into what God wants them to do and to be you and I every one of us as responsibility to see somebody else grow into what God's trying to get them to grow into. In other words, I have a responsibility in your spiritual life. You have a responsibility in my spiritual life. We are to be equipping one another, working for and with one another, edifying one another. That's the picture here. God, has, listen, God has given his body, his church, everything it needs to grow. That's right. Everything it needs to grow. He's gifted it just like what it needs to be. He's given us grace. He's given us gifts. Listen, if this church is not growing, can any of us say it's because God didn't do whatever? Can we say that? Of course not. He's given us everything we need. So if Midlands Bible Baptist Church is not growing the way Midlands Bible Baptist Church should, where should we point the finger? And don't point it at the camera and say, Pastor. <laughs> I mean, maybe, I don't know. I, no, listen. Let's all of us take that finger and say, if it's not growing the way it ought to grow, Amen. in some way, maybe I'm not exercising my gifts the way I ought to. Let's first and foremost be concerned with ourselves. Begin there, right? Uh, though we should be invested in, in, and help others grow, let's first and foremost make sure, hey, am I using the gift God's given me for his purposes? These gifts are not given for us to use as we will. These are supposed to be under his submission. Understand, please, I want us all to make sure we understand this. That we have been gifted by God. Every one of us has been given a gift, an ability that is designed by him to move this church forward. You've been given, you've been given a gift to move this church forward. You have, listen, you have a gift that is absolutely necessary in this church. You have a gift. You have an ability that God has given to you that is crucial for this church being everything, everything God wants. I'm going to throw my notes at you. How about that? <laughs> um, you have been given a gift that is absolutely necessary for this church to be everything God wants for it to be. In other words, if... Our mindset is, well, they'll get on without me. The church will survive without me. I can, I can, uh, I can come occasionally, and I can 
sit and be fed and be ministered to. And I might pick up a broom or a songbook here and there. But in our minds, we know we're not serving the way he would have us to serve. What that's doing is keeping Midlands Bible Baptist Church from being everything God wants it to be. Listen, if that's the mindset of one, if that's the collective mindset of all, that we would say in some way, I'm not as important as somebody else, or, or I don't have as big a role as somebody else. Well, my gift isn't really that crucial. No, if that's our mindset, listen, what we're doing is we're keeping this church from being everything it's supposed to be. So how are you using your gifts? I'm thankful for all the ways people are involved. Please don't see this as, as a pastor berating and saying, you know, we're, just, we're not doing enough. Or, no, that's not the case. I'm grateful. I praise the Lord for the ways in which Mid Midlands Bible Baptist Church does minister. I'm thankful for that. But I do know this. Every one of us is given a gift. Therefore, every one of us should be involved. It's good. You've heard of the Pareto Principle. I've talked about it before, 80 percent of the effect coming from 20 percent of the cause we often see it 80 percent of the work being done by 20 percent of the people that ought not be the case that's right in the church that god help us if that's the case in the church where 20 percent of the people do 80 percent of the work that's a church that's sick spiritually sick that means there's a lot of sick spiritually sick members within that church that can't be the case in a church. Every one of us is to be involved. Listen, every one of us is to be involved to the extent that he would have us be. Mm -hmm. Not to the extent that I feel comfortable being. Or to the extent that I think I can afford to be. Or to the extent that I feel like I have time to be. No, our gifts are given to us from our Savior. Therefore, our attitude should be whatever you want. This is your gift. I'm ready to serve you however you need me to serve. You've been given a gift by God to serve his church, to serve other people that make up his church. What are you doing with what you've been given? Are you turning those five talents into five more? Or that two talents into two more? Or that one into another? Or like the wicked servant, you take that and hide it and bury it. Don't use it for his purposes. 1 Peter 4.10 says this. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Are we stewarding his gifts the way he intends for us to? Using his gifts the way he intends for us to? We say this month is launch out in fellowship. And honestly could have just as easily been launch out in edification. That would have been, been fine. When I say fellowship, and I, I use it in this, you know, what we're focusing on for this month. Please don't see it in the narrow sense of again, what takes place before a service or after service. You know, that that time when you have somebody over your home and you're talking football or you're talking hunting or talking shopping, whatever ladies talk about. <laughs> talking kids, whatever it is. That we get. Is, that, is that okay to do? Are we allowed to do that? Sure, that's, that's building relationships. And you know what that is? That's a crucial part of being able to invest spiritually in somebody. That's a good thing to do. But when I say fellowship, biblical fellowship is much more than that. It's centered on Christ. It's focused on Christ. It's focused on spiritual things, spiritual, we say growth, the help of one another. Listen, fellowship, that is what I'm talking about. Fellowship is that is purposely designed to equip. Fellowship that is advancing the work of the ministry. Fellowship that is purposefully um, edifying, building up this body. That type of fellowship. 
fellowship that is promoting another's, another person's spiritual growth. If I can encourage you, when we are able to have services again, when that happens, when we begin to meet together again as a body, be here, first off. Mm-hmm. I encourage you to be here. All right? I, I, and it's the way that it looks as far as how this is going to happen. It's not going to be just, all right, deadline is up or whatever it is. Now, everybody go back to normal. It's going to be a gradual thing. So please don't say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait to the very last minute. Uh, I think part of it's just going to need to be a step of faith saying, hey, we're going to trust the Lord. It's going to keep us safe. All right? As a church body, I, I, I do not want... To see, I, I, I can't in my mind fathom seeing that. You know, we've got to slowly, gradually work our way back into services. I encourage you to be back in services. Be here. Because, listen, you can't edify work of the ministry. You can't equip somebody else on your own. All right? Now, there are creative ways. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second. We're done. But be here. When you're here, please use your gifts. Use your gifts. You've got a gift, at least one, all of us do. Many have been given many more than that. Use your gift the way he designed it to be used. Plenty of areas in ministry where we can and should use our gift. Plenty of areas in ministry that don't require a gift. I don't think there is a gift that's mentioned that's necessary for mowing the lawns. I don't think you have to have a spiritual gift for that. But listen, there are places where your spiritual gift, listen, is designed by the one who gave it to see this church move forward. Catch this. When we do begin to meet again, purposefully, intentionally, decisively act to edify and encourage and equip the people in this church. That's good. No, no, no. Don't accidentally, if it comes up in a conversation, I might say an encouraging word to somebody. Or I might ask them how their walk with the Lord is. No, 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 that's, that's not using the gift the way we believe, I believe it should be. We're going to see more of that next, this one say, Lord, Lord. Practically speaking, listen, listen. Intentionally, decisively work at building relationships Work at showing love. Listen, work at getting past the shallow, the skin deep, how you doing? Which, again, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. When you come to church, ask somebody how they're doing. And they say, good, that's good. And don't do that. But here at church, there, there's, a, there's another layer to that. Yeah. That, can we be honest, is a little awkward sometimes to get into. Mm-hmm. And maybe the setting isn't, you know, two minutes before service in a bustle of the sanctuary to get into that second layer. Maybe it is in a different setting where you meet with somebody, you go out to lunch or you go out after service or you meet in a classroom and you get into that second layer. How are you really doing? What's your walk with the Lord really like? That's, listen, that's intentionally, purposefully edifying and equipping and working in the ministry. Listen, what that requires is, again, us being willing to get past that first layer past that awkwardness. Listen, it requires of us to be open to being helped in that way. If our mindset is, I'm the one that should be helping you, and you're trying to talk to me, again, if our mindset is one of pride, or of I've got, I've got, we wouldn't say I've got everything figured out, but I've got most everything figured out. I'm good. I don't need you coming and asking me how I'm doing. I don't need you trying to encourage me. Now listen, that attitude, this type of body Building, if I can say it that way, won't take place if that's our attitude. We're not humble enough to say, I recognize you're here to help me. I'm here to help you. We're going together to build one another up. That won't happen if our attitude is, I've got it. I'm good. Those are some ways I encourage you to, when we begin to have services again, do those things specifically. Say, what about until that time? When, when, what can we do now? Well, I, I mentioned um, one of the ways. Can I just make an announcement in the middle of the service or at the very close of the service? I didn't keep saying that. Um, enroll in one of these discipleship groups. Okay, what that is is a smaller version 
it's a smaller group where you're able to maybe get into that second layer a little bit. And you're not going to run into the, the bustle of a sanctuary. There's going to be, by, by design, there's going to be some accountability. There's going to be some, um, there's going to be obviously some Bible study and some devotion. There's going to be some time in the Word. There's going to be some fellowship. And when I say fellowship, yes, talk about kids and talk about sports and everything else. But listen, our fellowship is to be centered on Christ and what we have in common in Him. Yeah. And they're going to be, they're designed to have prayer and getting to know people again beyond that surface level. In a setting like that, I do think it's conducive to making that second or that extra effort to really make an investment in somebody. The idea that I'm in trying to get across with launching out in fellowship is this. We are not meant to try to do this Christian life alone. You can't. Amen. You'll fail. All of us will. So what else can we do until we're able to meet again? Oh, get creative. I just leave it there. A very quick and simple application. Get creative. <laughs> Make phone calls, text messages, send somebody a verse, things like that. What needs to be happening is as individuals within this church, we are building one another up, serving one another, seeing that I have and that you have a responsibility, a mandate from our God who, gave, who, who has given us these gifts to use those gifts to help somebody else. Every member has a part to play in seeing someone else grow into what Christ has for them to be and to do. Think about as people come to know the Lord, saved, they're going to need a church that is equipping for the work of the ministry so that the body is edified. They're going to need that. New believers will. Listen, old believers do. I've been saved for years. I'm beyond that type of help in my life. No, you're not. None of us are. So do you understand that you've been gifted by our victorious ascended Savior? And the reason you've been gifted is to actively, purposefully engage in seeing somebody else build up. That's good. Every part of the body is necessary. Everyone here, everyone at home, you're part of the body. You've been gifted. God's given you that gift for a specific purpose in this church. And this church can't be everything God wants it to be until we're using our gifts the way he'd have us to. We've been gifted to serve. We've been gifted to build. We've been gifted to edify. Listen, we've been gifted to grow. So church, please, use what you've been given the way God wants you to use it. Father, I thank you for this passage. Is, um, Lord, a lot here, and I, I pray that, Father, what we've covered this morning has been clear, and it is clear in our hearts and our minds. I pray each one of us understands what we've been given in Christ, Lord. It's beyond salvation. We have so much more than salvation. I pray you'd help us to see our place of service. Help us see, Father, that we are responsible for the person sitting in the pew next to us, that person that is in their home watching a service, Lord, that we are responsible to help them move forward. I pray you'd help us to get beyond, to get beyond the awkward, the shallow, and really purposefully make the effort to edify, to equip, to work. Father, if there's someone at home today and they're watching this video, and Lord, we've talked about serving grace. Father, they've not experienced your saving grace. Lord, I pray you'd help them see that nothing they do will be good enough. 
their only hope is to receive what Christ has already done. Father, help them to see their need of a Savior. I pray they'd reach out, contact this church, contact myself, someone else, Lord. The gospel could be shared and received, Father. Help this church. We want to be. We want to be all that you've called us to be. All that you desire for us to be in this community we're in. So, Father, help each one of us individually to do all that we ought to do, to be all that we ought to be. Help us to respond to this message in specific ways that you'd have us to for your glory. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, church, for watching. Appreciate you being part of our service today.